Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Bob Sines is on the show today. Bob is an actor, a screenwriter, and the author of the book, That's Not the Way It Works, a no-nonsense guide to the craft and business of screenwriting. I read his book before the interview, and I can say without exaggeration that it is the most practical, on-point, and helpful screenwriting book I've read. In the book, Bob, of course, covers the nuts and bolts and other technical aspects of writing down the bones of a screenplay. But what sets this book apart is he also goes into the nuances that I've never seen covered in other books, even in the go-to screenwriting books that have been around for decades. He talks about the how-tos of getting your screenplay read by the right people, and probably most importantly, really prepares you for the extremely high likelihood that your screenplays will be rejected exponentially more often than they will be optioned or purchased, let alone actually made into a film. He also dispels a lot of myths about screenwriting in Hollywood, which I found refreshing and inspiring. Another inspiring thing about Bob is that he didn't quit his day job and make the leap into film until he was 40 years old. So for listeners who think it may be too late for you to make that leap into whatever creative endeavor you're passionate about, this interview is for you. Bob got his start in television as an extra on the show Nash Bridges starring Don Johnson and since that time has optioned and sold numerous screenplays for television and film, including the film Extracurricular Activities, a dark comedy which is now streaming on Amazon. The film is about a high school kid who hires himself out to arrange for the accidental death of the parents of fellow high school students. Although it doesn't sound funny, Extracurricular Activities is actually quite comical and lighthearted, despite the dark nature of the plot. So without further ado, let's jump right into my chat with Bob Sines. All right, here we go. Bob Sines, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, th this is a special um, quarantine edition of Dream Path Podcast. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been locked down for two weeks now. This is over two weeks. This is like day 17 or something. So Yeah, well, you guys really had the right idea pretty early on. Uh, even though I'm here up, up in Washington state, uh, we, we were pretty proactive as well, but I noticed California, uh, did the right thing pretty early. Yeah. And, and it's been, you know, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You well, know, it's, as 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 interesting as it can be. I mean, it's just been, it's been, uh, frustrating and, but totally, uh, you know, you totally understand it. So yeah, go from there. Right. Hasn't gotten away at work, so. Well, I would imagine that your work is is the same regardless of what's happening on the outside world. Yeah, but I, I didn't expect to actually get work work, and I've gotten work work. I've gotten, um, I'm going to be working on two rewrites, uh, paid rewrites during this time. Uh, one I had a meeting on yesterday, and one I'm having a meeting on tomorrow, so. Nice. Are you using Zoom for those meetings? No, I'll probably use the phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> so tell me how, um, how you got into the film business. And, and I know this goes way back to your Nash Bridges days, because I've done some research on you. And I, of oh. course, I, I read your book as well. And, Do I get uh, hold it up now? Oh, absolutely. Plug it. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Yeah. And I'll, I'll hold up mine as well. Yeah. It's doing extremely well. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations on the book. Thank you. The reviews, except for a couple of people who obviously hate me instead of the book. <laughs> um, um, but I was told by a bunch of uh, book people that until you get one-star reviews, people think all your five-star reviews are fake. Right. So I want to thank the two people that gave me one-star reviews. You've <laughs> done me a huge favor. Well, you're welcome. Both of those were mine. So. <laughs> Good. <laughs> just now we're not good now yeah. I'm of, uh, now i'm afraid of what you're gonna say in this uh this this interview no i really enjoyed it and we'll we'll get to your book because i i finished it last night and we, we have a lot to talk about in that book but good. Uh, maybe you could start off by telling listeners how you found the film industry as your professional calling 
when I was a young man in my teens, I loved acting. I mean, I just loved it. And I loved the stage. And so I did a lot of stage acting and I ended up getting paid for it. Um, I did summer stock. I did, I was a song and dance man and I did uh, summer stock and, and all kinds of things up to the point where I was 22 years old at the time uh, I was 22. I was doing a, uh, a year long gig in the fantastics in San Francisco. And I met my wife and I decided I could either A, become an actor and make no money, or B, marry my wife and have a family and stability and not be an actor. And I chose B because she's amazing and I'm still married to her. Um, and then when I turned and I did other things and I was very successful. And um, when I turned 40, the business I was in, which was the wholesale furniture business, was going through a radical change that the business didn't want to acknowledge was coming. And because of that, they didn't want to acknowledge it. They pretty much died. And um, I saw it and I said, you know what? I think I want to be an actor again. I'm going to give it a try. And my wife, when I picked her up off the floor, said, okay, you got a couple of years. And I ended up getting my SAG card in a movie called Angels in the Outfield, where I yelled, Try throwing it over the plate. (laughs) That was you? Yes. Oh, nice. And um, I remember that scene. Yes, that was uh, that was me. And um, and and then I did a um, I did a bunch of extra work because uh, I wanted to be on sets and learn everything I could learn because that's me. I just I, I just suck in information. Um, and so I did that and ended up getting in a uh, job as an extra on the very first episode of Nash Bridges on the very first day of filming. And I was one of two San Francisco cops. I was in the whole blue San Francisco cop uniform. And, and I was standing out there and Don sidled up and went, hey, how you doing? And I talked to him and made him laugh a few times. And then you're talking about Don Johnson. Yes, I'm talking about Don Johnson. Right. And uh, sorry. And, um, um, uh, he laughed and asked me what my name was. And I said, told him, and we laughed again. And, and he said, well, I'm going to go to work. And I said, have fun. And the, one of the a second ADs who didn't last very long came up to me and said, you know, you'll never work in this town again because you talk to the star. And I said, okay. Cause I had no, you know, if somebody comes up to me and says, hello, I'm going to say hello back. But it, it ended up being, um, interesting because I thought, okay, so I never work on it again. It was fun. And they called me and said, the casting people called me and said, you've been requested to come work in his station house, walking around behind him with files and answering phones and whatever. And episode eight of the first season, they pulled me out of extras holding and said, uh, Don wants to see you. And I went and saw Don and he goes, we're throwing you a bone. We're giving you a name. We're elevating you to sergeant. And uh, here's your lines for this episode, which surprisingly enough was the episode that was on TV last night on the Nash Bridges reruns. No way. Which we watched (laughs) because I got to see myself 20 years younger and see how dark my hair was and how dark my mustache was. And And it was just really, you know, you look at yourself and you think, gee, you really have aged. Um, And so um, uh, I ended up doing 122 episodes of that show. Um, And it looked tiny. I mean, it was just, you know, some days I just walked around behind them. So, you know, one episode, my entire lines for the whole episode was, yeah. And and it it was um, it was fun and um uh, and i learned a ton about this business and as i read the scripts i thought gee i can do this i can write stuff like this so and it was funny because guys like sean ryan and damon lindelof were writing for nash bridges at the time (laughs) and you know those guys have gone on to huge things and 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 um i and i decided that that I could write an episode of Nash. So I did. And I gave it to him thinking, this is how it works. And that's not how it works. <laughs> um, and, and they gave it back to me, but they read it. 
Um, Carlton Cuse sent me a nice note, said, um, we don't do things this way. Um, we have a writer's room and we have the union and we have all this stuff, but nice job. Um, you actually, you know, you can actually write, you should keep, you should keep doing it. So nice. a little encouragement early nice on. Huh? Encouragement. So I, 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 uh, I wrote a, um, a, a, a movie, um, and, um, immediately optioned my first draft of that movie to, um, uh, a, a production company, Warner brothers who set it up at polygram pictures. And it was going forward until Polygram got bought by Universal and Universal dumped Polygram Slate and I got the script back. Huh. And it was it was my first big lesson in a lot of things. It was my first big lesson in you don't sell your first script in your first draft. It has to be an act of God or something because that doesn't happen. And it did and then it went away. And it taught me that you can you let your ego go crazy because you think now I'm going to be a writer and I'm going to be rich and I'm going to be famous. And then it goes and nobody returns your calls. And then you wait 18 years and then your first movie gets made. So let's go back a little bit to your, your furniture career. Okay. And uh, b- because I'm, I'm curious if, if it took to, until age 40 to make that leap. Yep. What was going on? What was going on between age 18 and 40 in your mind creatively? And, you know, what, what was nothing? Absolutely nothing. I was, I, 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 when I, I stopped doing anything creatively. I even, I was a musician. I have, I I was a guitar player and I did a lot of stuff and I played guitar for when I was, when I got my guitar out one day for, I don't know what reason. And my son was like 10 and I started playing it in the living room just to do it. And he came and sat down at my feet and I said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I didn't know you could do that. And I thought, wow, wow. What, yeah. am I, what have I been doing? And so it's just been, it's just been a weird trip. I just, I just shut myself down creatively. I did. I shut myself down. And then did you feel though that you in the outfield came to town truthfully? And they were looking for extras, and I and and I took my kids to show them how movies get made, and I loved it so much that I went back down there and registered as another extra, and through a lot of people that I knew from from my stage career that I ran into, I got a one line part, and 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 um, uh, it's a you know it's a it's another one of those miracle things. Yeah, and yeah. I just went to my wife and said, man, you know what? I want to do this. I just really I haven't. It is not out of my system. It's not. Yeah. And um, and situation was that I knew that the company I told my I told people who worked at the company I worked at that it wasn't going to be around in a year. And they all told me I was crazy and that I shouldn't be so negative And that, you know, maybe I was good that I quit because, you know, I was causing problems and it was gone in six months. So do you think that if you did not see that industry falling apart and your career in jeopardy, your non-arts career in jeopardy, that you would have made the leap that you did? I have no idea. I can't. And there's an answer question you can't really answer. Maybe. I don't know. I enjoyed doing that extra work so much. And and I did another one while I was still doing the furniture in the furniture business. I did a movie called uh, Murder of the First as a Alcatraz prison guard as a kind of a really featured extra thing because I was all over the place and I threw Kevin Bacon down a flight of stairs. So I I don't know. Um, It, I don't know. I can't answer that. Maybe. Yeah. So once you did make that leap and you are, you're, you're doing extra work and you're getting excited about it and um, you, you find the Nash Bridges project, which sounds really fortuitous because you have, you know, you have all this encouragement and Again, another miracle. Yeah. So w- when you wrote the Nash Bridges episode and then you, you wrote the, the feature that got um, picked up by the production company or optioned as you call it, um, what were you thinking in terms of what your calling was at that point? Because you're, you're an actor, you're a working actor, you're getting paid for it. Oh, 
Um, yeah, it's a steady was, gig. Uh, you have to understand, I've been in a lot of movies and I've been on TV and I've done a lot of things and, and I've done commercials and everything I've done has been this big. Okay. I, I'm, I didn't make a living as an actor. I had to go get jobs in, as, a, as a radio. I got a job as a radio DJ in San Francisco. Uh, first, I was a board op. And then uh, I was an overnight board op. And then overnight, I said, hey, I get a lot of calls. Can I record the calls and play those? And they went, yeah, do that. And then I recorded the calls. And then I talked on the calls. And I was fun. And they liked that. And then it kind of grew to me being on the air. And then I was on the air more. And then I was on the air more. And then the radio station went out of business. You know, they called all of us into the into a, into a room one morning and said, uh, oh, by the way, we're changing formats. You're all fired. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was guys that had been radio disc jockeys for four years. I mean, there were women who had been on the radio for you know ages, and they didn't care. They just said goodbye. It's radio is the most cutthroat business in the whole entire world. Um, but it was interesting, and then I went on to become a talk radio producer, and did that for a while while I was doing Nash Bridges because I needed to make money. My wife had a fantastic job. She was a nursing administrator in oncology at Stanford Hospital for 35 years. Oh, and, nice. And so she had a fabulous job. And she said, you know, I get to work and you get to play. But she was very supportive. She is very supportive. And now that the writing has taken off the way it has for me, she's retired. And I get to be the major breadwinner and, and, and do that. And that makes me feel good. When you wrote that that first episode of Nash Bridges, what did you study and pay attention to to be just technically to be able to put that together? Well, I knew the show up and up and down and, and I knew the characters and I knew that I knew what they did and what they thought and how they worked because I worked on the show. I watched it every day. And mm -hmm. I saw I knew what the scripts looked like. So I just sat down and wrote it. Right. And at the time that was kind of pre software days wasn't it or was there mm, there was some software yeah there was some software I, I i used i think i used movie magic screenwriter oh okay i remember that program um um and that was around um and and yeah it was you know it was uh it was it, i didn't know what i was doing but i just you know i i think i have a natural knack for it because i, I one there's one uh, big producer in LA who calls me the idiot savant of screenwriting <laughs> in my face. Um, who says, you know, you can look at a screenplay and kind of know what's missing. And, you know, that's not anything you can learn. And I, and I really appreciate that. From you. And, and so I just, I, I, I think I, I got a, God gave me a natural ability to do it. And I didn't notice it or know about it until I was 40. You know, that happens. So what, what about your acting experience do you think allowed you to become successful as a screenwriter? If, if, oh, if, if there's anything at all that you can draw from dialogue after being an actor, it's so much easier to write a dialogue. Even in the book, I talk about how I think that writers should take acting classes because they learn that they're convoluted junk that they write as dialogue and most of it is when you read new writer script is real and it doesn't sound real and when you get to an acting class and they hand you some of these things that don't sound real you go oh okay i get it and it helps you i, I really believe that it, that it helps a lot so t tell us about the the journey of your film extracurricular activities which is available on uh, on amazon and i've seen it by the way and really had a lot of fun watching it. It's a it's a great film, and I recommend Thank you. it. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, Extracurricular was a, was my second script I ever wrote. It was called Orphans originally, and uh, one of the producers or one of the one of the ads or it was an ad. It was an ad. It was a first ad at Nash Bridges. Read it and loved it, and wanted to. I pitched it to him on set. You know, after I'd gotten to know him over four or five years. 
and he read it and he loved it and he wanted to uh, option it and I let him um, and uh, he got it to a couple. I got it to a to a a uh, producer who loved it and couldn't make it. And then it got optioned again by another producer who absolutely loved it and couldn't make it. And then uh, to another producer who got it to Universal who loved it and didn't make it. Um, um, and I can, you know, kind of, that's a long story about that one. And then it just, it went through eight different producers and production companies in one studio before it got made by David Wilson and Jay Lowy. Uh, and how many years are we talking about here for that? Years. 18 years, 18 years from the day I wrote it to the day it got filmed. It was 18 years. And the, you talk about this in your book, but for my listeners who don't know what option means, can you explain that? Kind of a rent to own thing. It's they love your script, but they don't have the money to make it. So they're going to take your script and then they're going to help you develop it or develop it the way they want it developed, which means rewriting it with their notes. And there's aren't always the notes that you want, but it's the notes that you have to do because you want to get it made. And then, then they get it out to stars or to, to people with money who can finance it or to whoever they want to get it to get a package together to get it made. And they have a certain amount of time to do that. They can do it over 12 months or 24 months or 36 months, depending on how many times they re-option and re-option it. And then if they can't get it made, they just hand it back to you and say, thank you very much. We couldn't get it made. That happens seven times. And then the eighth time it stuck and they, they made it. And it, I was happy with it because it was my movie. It was very close to, you know, very, very close to the script that I originally wrote. So the, the, the process of optioning sounds like there's some some legalities that you probably should pay attention to. It's, just, it's twenty. It's a the, the my option, my option agreements average about twenty pages, and yes, you it's it's a legal it's a legal rent to own. You can't show it to anybody. You can't try and sell it. You can't do anything with it. And while they have the option, in right. fact, they can hire other writers to come and rewrite. It. And so, how did you navigate that? When you, um, probably I would imagine there was a point where, where you didn't have an agent or a manager or a lawyer to look at some of this stuff. I didn't have an agent or a manager until that final option by, by Jay Lowy and, 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 uh, and David Wilson and Jay Lowy referred me to a manager, called a manager that he knew and said, Hey, you should rep this guy. I didn't. I had had all kinds of options. I'd optioned probably seven or eight of my scripts up to that point by just sheer willpower and getting out there and networking and using what I had, the people that had optioned for me before and getting to other people and getting to other people. And just, it was just put my head down. You know, my, my, my youngest daughter said to me on the night that she got to come to the screening of extracurricular. Oh, I know it was one of the nights that I took her to the filming, uh, she and her husband. And she said, you know, I'm really proud of you because you just didn't give up. You just, you got, you got rejected so many times on so many levels and you just didn't give up. And that's my biggest lesson that I can teach anybody who wants to do this. You don't give up. You know, I, I was going to, you know, that's one of the bullet points I, I wrote down to prepare for the interview as I was reading your book, I, I was just writing down kind of salient points. And, and, um, what I wrote down was philosophy of rejection. And, and I think that your book is in, in large, in a large way, um, a philosophy book, it, not so much as a technical book. And there's some technical things that you learn about screenwriting in your book, but my takeaway was, cause I've read a lot of screenwriting books. Um, but my takeaway was this kind of prepares you mentally for what, what you need to endure in the industry. You need to endure a lot. I mean, right. this, this is a business of complete rejection. I mean, absolute 
complete rejection. Goodbye. We don't want to talk to you again. We don't like what you wrote. We're not interested. And the thing about it is, is that what most people do is they take it personally. They take it, they take it that these people have rejected them. And they don't care enough about you personally to reject you personally. They only care about what you've written. And if they don't want what you've written for whatever reason, it could be great, but it's not what they're looking for. It could be horrible and they go, ooh, I don't want to have anything to do with, you know, this script. It doesn't matter. It's not personal. It's not an affront to you. It's about what's written on the page. And if you realize that, you can, it's a lot easier to take. Plus, you know, it's a matter of numbers. Uh, if, If you, you know, in the introduction to the book, I talk about the sheer numbers of scripts out there versus the sheer numbers of films that get made or TV shows that get made. And it's a really sobering that much of a percentage that that's what's so sobering about reading your book. And I, and I don't want to be doom and gloom about it because I, I, I think it's the best screenplay book I've, I've ever read. (laughs) And and I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not just trying to, uh, to to gush here because I'm interviewing you, but um, I've read a lot of them and, and they're, you know, a lot of them are, are preachy about, formulas and the three act structure and um the 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 rules of living of, proof that the rules don't that there aren't <laughs> right um, um because i write scripts that that just want them left and right and there aren't any rules do you know that producers when they read your script they're not looking for rules they're looking to see if you have a good story or not if your story is great that's all that counts it doesn't matter if you're you're you, if something happens on page 10 or page 18 or page 41, they don't care. They don't look for that stuff. They look for a great story. And you can write a great story that doesn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. So, and it, it was, it's really refreshing to hear that from someone who is a professional in the industry who's made films and has been in it that long. Um, and it also, as of the film that just got greenlit, I'm now on, um, I'm now on number 16, 16. Congratulations. Produced film that I have credit on. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So, but, but the, the other thing about the book that I appreciate is that it dispels a lot of myths that people have. There's this mystique about Hollywood. And I think one of your chapters talks about how there is no Hollywood. No, <laughs> like, there isn't any Hollywood. There's an idea of yeah. Hollywood that everybody has in their minds, but there's no actual physical, like, oh, that's that's the building where Hollywood is in, or that's the well, neighborhood of Hollywood. It's there. There's an ethos there. Yes, but but there's not this um, structure that people create in their their minds that ha- that's based in reality. Yeah, they, it's, they they think there's this monolith called Hollywood. And that right. everybody in Hollywood all communicates with each other and they decide how they're going to do things. And that Hollywood is, is this thing that keeps writers out and this thing that keeps you from becoming a famous actor or this thing. But it isn't a thing. It's, it's a gr- uh, the, 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 the film and television business is a gigantic mass of companies and, and individual producers and studios that all operate independently from each other and don't consult with each other about how they're going to handle things. They're all different. Every one of them works differently. I've worked with dozens of them and they all operate on a a completely differently about what they expect and what they want and how they do things. And yes, there are some through lines that go through because they've all discovered that no, they can't take um, unsolicited scripts because they'd be buried in them. Yes, they want to have scripts that have been pre, you know, looked at and 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 gone over before they get them from agents or managers or through query letters. Um, but that's only for self preservation, because otherwise, you know, you remember Amazon when they first started. Wanted to take scripts from anybody. They'll take scripts from everybody because they had the philosophy that they were going to find all those scripts that the studios and the production companies missed. 
And they found out there weren't any. You know, they spent millions of dollars looking at all these scripts and doing all this stuff and found out there weren't any. They were 98% of all scripts that are written are crap. And and that's just that's just true because it takes eight or nine scripts for the for a normal somebody who's just starting to be a a screenwriter to get to their stride if they work really hard at it and try and learn and and grow and understand how a film is structured and how story is structured. It's all about story. It's, it's, and, and how to write a film and how, how it's, so it's auditory and visual that you can waste half your script describing things that it's n- not your job to describe. Mm-hmm. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place, our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks. And now back to the interview. Another big takeaway from the book is writing to budget. Oh. And I, I don't think I've read that, that, that type of chapter in another screenwriting book. Uh, and if I have, it, it wasn't emphasized enough. But you really talk about the importance of writing to budget. And can you tell our listeners why they should pay attention to that? There are six or seven entities um, there are less because Disney hasn't bought a spec script in five years. And now Fox is a part of Disney. And so they won't be buying spec scripts. And, and a spec script is what? An original spec script. It's the one you write, you know, you come up with a story and you write it and it's yours and you want to sell it. They just don't buy them anymore. They do everything in house and, or they're doing, you know, whatever they're doing the way they're doing it. And, and they don't, they're not soliciting them. They don't want them. And, and, uh, and so every once in a while, a great film gets made like, um, like a rival and from something, but Eric Heiser wrote that script 10 years before it got made 10 years. Okay. And so th- there are all kinds of stories that way. And there are very few that get made, but there are tons of producers and tons of productions company companies that are looking for films that are, a million to $5 million and sometimes under a million dollars. And you have to learn how to write those films. But as a professional writer for a screenwriter, you need to learn how to write to a budget anyway, because if you want to be a professional writer, the most of your jobs are right for hire jobs that you get from production companies. Uh, The last job that I had, three producers came to me with a five page um, treatment. And said, can you write a movie out of this for us and we'll pay you? And I said, yes, I can. Here's my ideas and here's the direction I think it would be fun to go. And they agreed with me. And this is a film that just got greenlit. But I got hired to write it. And so far, I've been the only writer on it, which has been pretty fun. Um, I don't know if that will change, but so far, it's been pretty great. And, uh, And they've been fantastic. And so have the people who are going to produce it. And when they came to me, I said, what's the budget? What is the budget you're shooting for on this script? And they said, $2.5 million. And I knew exactly what to put in the script. I get hired by production companies who will come to me with a script and say, don't change the story. Don't change the dialogue. Take a million dollars out of the budget. Otherwise, we can't make it. And they'll pay me to do that. And right. so uh, writers need to know these things. I, I hear, I, wa- I read, you know, blogs and I look at uh, film writing, the screenwriting, Facebook pages and, and watch Twitter. And, and people will say, oh, it doesn't matter what your budget is. They'll change it if they, if, they, if they need to. And that's not the case. If you've got a super expensive movie and you've got a producer who has $3 million to spend, they aren't even going to read it. Right. And, and it sounds like there's some very practical things that you can do as a writer to write to a, a, a lower budget. Including... Oh, there's a huge list of them in the book. 
Yeah. But you know, it's how many people have speaking lines, believe it or not. You get those guys, the one, one line, they went that away people. And those are expensive. It's their SAG. They get paid SAG. They have to pay their, they have to pay all the SAG, you know, ancillary costs, which are a lot. And, and it's just, it gets expensive. And so you cut down those things. That's why when you watch a movie and they go, which way do they go? And somebody just points, that's an extra that they didn't have to pay all that money to. <laughs> There's a couple in the scene and they're like a married couple. And the only one person talks, the husband talks or the wife talks and the husband sits there like this. Yep. That guy's an extra <laughs> and he's not getting paid what she's getting paid. Right. I don't think after reading your book, I don't think people will watch movies the same way again <laughs> because they're really going to see you, you really see why things are the way they are. Yes. When you, when you read your book well, and when you, you watched extracurricular, yeah. I originally wrote the basketball game as a football game because it was more because it was just, I did it. And they came to me and said, we got to rewrite it as a basketball game because the football game's too expensive. And right. I went, okay. Yeah, football games outside, so you have an out outdoor shoot. Yep. And then you got more people in the stands, yep. right? And yeah. and more people on the field and more things going on. And the basketball game ended up being a really good scene. But it was easier to shoot. It was indoors. It could control the environment. It was just a better, much cheaper. It probably cost a tenth of what the football game would have cost. Have you found that the attention span of people that that used to watch movies and maybe no longer do, or they're skewing more towards uh, YouTube videos or shorter television series and things like that. Is that changing the, the industry at all in terms of how films are written and, and runtime and that type of thing? You know, not full length films. It's not changing how they're written, but it's changing how, how series are, are written. I mean, I, 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 I don't get Quimby. So I have no idea. Um, it's, you know, 10 minute movies. And I think that's great. If people want to write the shorts like that, I think it's super. And, 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 uh, and I like, there are some um, shows on like Facebook that are the 10 minute shows that are kind of fun and those lead to other things. So there, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do now. And then and that has changed. Uh, but the streaming people have changed series forever because they've gone to the British model, which was always eight to 10 episodes of a season. And, and that's what you did. And, and the British have been doing that for years and the, and they just got, and it worked for them. And, right. and we just started doing it here with the Netflix and the Amazons and stuff. And, and, but it also opened up creativity in those things and you didn't have to worry about network sensors anymore either. You could be, you could be funnier and, and take more chances and be edgier and, and be scarier and be uh, outrageous. And, and that's one of the things that's changed too, because, you know, in a movie, you could be outrageous, but you're outrageous for two hours for a series where you can be outrageous. You can be outrageous for 10 hours. Right. And then the, you can have slower character development. Oh, and much slower. And you can do many more things uh, to, to make. And, and you'll find things that you never knew existed in your characters that, that build over the years or the, or the seasons that you can, that you can do. I've sold a series. I sold a, I sold a pilot to a production company who took it to Netflix and Netflix said, no, no, we don't want it. And they're still hot on it and they still love it. And we're going to see where they take it next, but I would love to see it go. Um, it's pretty funny and it's very strange and it's, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a modern throwback type thing. It's just weird. And, and there are going to be people who get it, and there are going to be people who don't get it. So you wrote a television series on spec. How many episodes did you write to? I wrote one. I wrote one and yeah. a, a mini Bible um, with all the information about where I saw it going and where the arcs were going to go and where the season would go and how the first season would go and all that stuff. 
but they don't want you to write the episodes because they may have a completely different idea by the time they rewrite that pilot or you rewrite the pilot or a showrunner rewrites that pilot and it goes in a different direction. All those extra episodes you wrote and all that work you did is for not. Right. So you don't write 10 episodes of anything. If, if, if the pilot gets, gets bought and I get an opportunity to be involved in it or not, depending on who the showrunner is, because I don't, have, I don't have the bandwidth to be a showrunner. I don't know enough about it. And if somebody came to me and said, you could, you know, would you like to showrun the show? I would say, no, I'd like to learn how to showrun it by, you know, maybe shadowing a showrunner or being there with a showrunner. But I'm, I, I am freely admit, I don't know enough about it to do it well yeah. and i don't want to do anything that i can't do well all of the showrunners that i've heard interviewed sound exhausted <laughs> <laughs> they really do they're just well, like you know I mean, what it's a huge <laughs> job it's it's a huge job yeah and and um uh, i you know am i up for a huge job like that i don't know maybe but i would have to learn how to do it first and so if i had an opportunity to write some of the other episodes of the show, would I do it? Absolutely. Would I love doing it? Absolutely. But I also understand that it is a, a business that, that, that is a group business. It's everything is done. Um, you know, uh, like I said in the book, the, my, my definition of a screenwriter's job is everything that all the people who are in the credits don't do. All those people have a, an effect on where the script goes, how the script hits the screen, and everything else. So you have to work in cooperation with all those people to get your film or your show or, or your series on the air. You, you talk in your book about spec scripts and how brutal that work is. Um, and it, and it does sound brutal because well, it's, it's not, it, it's not brutal. It's just the, it's the nature of the business. The, um, the, the, every script gets rewritten, every script, no matter what, who it is or what it is, every script gets rewritten. And it's 90% of the time. It's not by the original writer. By the time it gets, I was the, one of the movies that I've got coming out this year, I was the fifth writer hired. The fifth one. And I rewrote the entire script from top to bottom, gave it a whole. The last 30 pages are completely mine. Nothing that any other writer wrote in that first, those first scripts is in those last 30 pages. Right. And then I rewrote the dialogue and most of the story for the preceding 70 pages. I think what I'm trying to get at when I said brutal is that financially to, to rely upon spec scripts as a way to make a living. It's, it almost sounds like you, you just can't do that. Nobody makes a living selling spec scripts, uh, screenwriters. Your living is made by writing great spec scripts that people really love your style and love the way you write and love your understanding of what it takes to build a story in a script. And then they hire you to do rewrites and polishes and adaptations and all kinds of things to, to that's where you make your money. That's if I can get three rewrite jobs a year, I'm happy. I've made a lot of money and I do well. And I'm, and, and there are years when you get none and there are years when you get five. How much of your time, just at at any given day, a day in the life of Bob signs, how much of your time is dedicated to spec scripts, whether they be uh, television or film, and assigned writing projects where you know you're getting paid? When I'm on an assignment, I don't do any spec script writing. None. I spend my time working on that particular assignment. I, I, I do whatever. If I've been doing a spec, it just it goes dormant. And then I just work on that until it's done. And then if I don't have another job to follow it, I start working on my specs again. So it's a, it's a compartmentalized thing. I don't, I don't try and write specs while I'm writing, while I'm writing uh, assignment work. It just, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work. 
are spec scripts to you kind of like the the holy grail in terms of create because they're purely from you and if they're bought sure they're really they're really buying your they're buying you and your idea and oh sure your creativity I, I, just, I wrote a, i wrote my first horror script um i had uh, uh two years ago in 2018 i had bladder cancer i got diagnosed with bladder cancer and i had chemo and um during the time right after that I decided this is a perfect time to write a horror script. And I wrote my first horror script and it got pretty well received. And my, my manager and my agent loved it. And the upshot of it is this year, about, about three weeks before we were quarantined, it got optioned. Um, and it's an original script. Now they're already telling me the things they want to change, which is fine. I right. mean, you know, you have to live with it, but, Yes, it's pretty exciting to have one of your original script shop options. It's uh, it's fun. The two movies I have coming out this year were both assignment jobs, but my name's on them as the writer, and I'm happy about that. And then I've got this other one that's greenlit, and that's going to have my name on it as writer. And and I I I count those as produced films that I wrote because I did write them. But the specs are always the ones you know extracurricular was a spec and it's going to always be a little more special to me. Yeah. Well, I love how, how accessible the, you know, these platforms are Amazon prime and Netflix and Hulu. It, it, are there more opportunities for writers now that there's just m more content out there? Yeah. But, but Netflix will ask a manager, they'll look at before they read something, what have they done? Right. They're not looking for something, somebody new. They're just not. I mean, you know, you'll find that most of the writers that are successful these days have sold a independent film script that's really good and had it made. And it did OK. It got great reviews, may not have made any money, but it got great reviews or it made money and didn't have to be have great reviews because it made money. But it did something. It got that that writer noticed to the point where people who are looking for writers for or looking for pr product will now look at you. You know, people say, I want to write for Marvel. Well, what they don't know is all those people that wrote for Marvel all wrote small independent films that got some notice before Marvel wanted to sit down and talk to them. Or they won the nickel, you know. Yeah, the big screenwriting contest you talk about in your book. The Academy, the Motion Picture Academy runs. And the two big contests are the Nickel and, Austin. and, and the Austin. Yeah, and Austin, yeah. because Austin is a completely screenwriter-centric film festival. That's what they, that's what they, that's their big thing is it's a screenwriter film festival, which I think is cool. There are, there are I wish there were more of them. Screenwriting to me seems like a pretty solitary activity. It, do, oh. do you did you find do you find that there that it lends itself to mentoring and um, you know collaboration? Sure. I mean, you have to be a collaborator. I mean, everything gets rewritten. If you don't coll collaborate, then they're going to find another writer who will. I mean, they don't have any problem firing you like that. Mm. Okay. And it's because it's the nature of the business, not because it, again that they that they're you know that they're looking forward to firing you. But it's the nature of the business. You collaborate, and they get as much out of you as they can. And when they don't think they can get anything more out of you that they need, then they find somebody else that that might do it. Which is why you can be the fifth screenwriter hired. Are, are there any screenplays that you, I, I imagine you've read a lot of screenplays in your, in your days. Um, are there any screenplays that you you've read and from, I'm talking about like screenplays that people would know about because they've seen the movie uh, that you really wish you wrote. I mean, they're just so good. Oh, they're yeah, great Ellie examples. Confidential. <laughs> uh, LA confidential. Oh yeah. I yeah, wish I'd written that one. I mean, I'd oh, that's a great one. Great script. I love that script. I wish I'd written Inside Man, which I think is one of the great movies of all time. 
um, uh, uh, you know, and then you go back to, you know, something like Back to the Future or which is, I think, if you if for a screenwriter, read that script. It's a perfect script. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't thought about that movie in a long time, but that I remember watching it and as a as a teenager and you know it, it was a, a cultural phenomenon well yeah but it was also just an incredibly well-written script right and and so yeah there are some scripts that i you know but again i i uh, personally i live in reality and can't think about things that weren't mine i try and write the best script that i can write that's mine and and hopefully it, it will it will resonate with somebody Right, and I've been pretty fortunate. I've been, you know, fortunate to have uh, optioned a, a, a whole bunch of my original scripts. Not a lot of them have gotten made. You know, there's three that's gotten that have gotten made, but but I'm not. Uh, you know, it's it's a crapshoot uh, of crapshoots because there have to be a million things that go right for a movie to get made. It's a miracle. Any movie that gets made is a miracle. And then if the movie is good, that's a second miracle. So great movies to me are like two miracle movies and they are absolute. It's absolutely true. I've, I've talked to, to uh, big time producers who have told me, you know what? You're right. It is. That's exactly right. It's a miracle on top of a miracle. <laughs> have you ever thought about becoming a producer or a director? Oh no. I, I, you know what? I've watched directors. That's too much work. I'm, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the, the eye for it. I don't have the, I'm, uh, it, it would be, I, I'm producing. Yes. I, I would love to do that. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm, if this horror movie gets made, um, they've already told me I'd get a producer credit and I could be a producer on it, but, but I'm, I don't know. I mean, uh, directing. No, I directed a short film once it was awful. <laughs> and, and, uh, I thought it was going to be great and it, it was awful. And, and I, I didn't know what I was doing and I tried to learn as much as I could, as quickly as I could. I got thrown into it at the last minute. I had been hired to do a, a, a rewrite on the script. And then the director stepped away and the producer, the guy who was putting the money up for it and wanted to star in it. Who was a good actor. Um, said, do you want to direct it? And I went, sure. I'll try. And I mean, it was, it was fun. And there's some great moments in it that I, that I thought of and that I, that I did that I think I'm pretty proud of, but overall, no, I mean, it was, it was a lot of work and and a lot of, a lot of uh, hats to wear and a lot of things to do that I just, it's not me. And so a man's got to know his limitations to quote uh, uh, Clint Eastwood. And, uh, or Dirty Harry, and I know my limitations, but producing, yes, I could do that. Are there any mistakes that you made in your yeah. career uh, that, that you look back on that you're like, you know what? I, we I don't really have time. <laughs> 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 uh, I made every mistake that every new writer makes. I, right. I, I, I networked incorrectly and I, and I assumed things incorrectly and I did, you know, I, I was desperate or I was uh, fearful or I was all those things that I talk about in the book that you shouldn't do or things that I did. I mean, I didn't do, I mean, in the book, there's a chapter on how not to market yourself. Right. And luckily I didn't do any of those things because those things are insane. Yeah. And I think the book is, it, it's a great encapsulation of basically a lifetime of lessons learned uh, that probably would be impossible to summarize in one answer to a question in a podcast, but I thought I'd <laughs> ask it anyway. No, I mean, it's just yeah. the, it's a, a, a myriad of, of, of idiotic things that, that I did. Mm. And it's what most people do when they're trying to learn something new. They think they know more than they know. They have a tendency to dispense bad information. Um, and I did, I did all that stuff. I did. I believe that there were rules at one point, um, till I discovered there weren't by writing something that broke all of them, which was my second script. But I didn't realize it was breaking all the rules I broke because I just wanted to write a good story that got people's attention. I didn't know you're 
protagonist had to have an arc. So I didn't give him one and nobody said anything. Right. Cause they liked the story. If you were going to give advice to a room full of high school kids, high school seniors that are about to apply for college, or maybe they're, they're college students and they're thinking about applying to film school uh, because they really want to get into the industry and they want to work in film and they want to write. What would be your advice to them in terms of the steps they should take to be as prepared as possible for what you're doing today? Get on as many sets as you can get on doing whatever you can do. I'm so glad that I did the extra work I did. I, it really paid off because I got to see how movies were made. I got to see how inexpensive, you know, shoot for under a million dollar budget movies were made. I got to see how shoot for under a hundred thousand dollar budget movies were made. And I got to see how hundred million dollar movies were made because I was an extra on a few of those. And I got to see how all of that worked and how all of that happened. And you just, you pay attention and you learn and you don't, you know, and, and, and so get on as many sets as you can get on. If you're, if your friends are making a movie, be a PA, be, you know, be, be an assistant camera operator, be whatever you can be to learn how these things are done well and how they're done poorly. Um, read as many scripts as you can get your hands on good ones, bad ones, your films, you loved, films, you hated films from other writers that, you know, you just, you read you voraciously read scripts and look at how the good ones are done and look at how the poor ones are done hmm. and learn for yourself how, how this works. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of screenwriting books, which is why I wrote the one I wrote. Because I just, there are things in a lot of those books that don't make any sense to me. Um, well, I'm not going to go into specifics because I'm not. And, but I, I think that doing is, is more of an education than reading about it. So write scripts, write as many scripts as you can write. Take the time to to learn about how scripts are written and how research works and how, how characters are developed and how all these things go into what you're going to write and reading scripts is going to help you do that. But also just doing it. Your first script is going to be awful. 99% of everybody's first scripts are horrible. And that's to be, it's to be uh, expected because it's such a different writing discipline from any other writing discipline that there is. And you have to learn about dialogue and you have to go out and listen to how people speak and, and eavesdrop on dialogue and listen to what people say to each other and how subtext is a way of life for 90% of the people on earth who don't always say what they mean, but dance around it. And that's what real dialogue sounds like in a movie. So it sounds like a lot of your advice is very practical, hands-on, just do it type of advice. You can't, you know, everybody will tell you, you know, apprentice plumbers have to learn by doing it. You know, apprentice electricians have to learn by doing it. Apprentice writers, screenwriters have to learn by doing it. You can't just write your first movie and then wait for the studios to come and buy it. It's that's folly and and it's something that all new writers need to learn yeah for me um I, I think the the writer's block everybody talks about writer's block for me the idea of writing something that sucks is almost it's so unpalatable that i i don't know <laughs> I, that's the barrier for me. Yeah, but you I, don't know it sucks until you get. I mean, you don't. Know right. That. I mean, you're you, but you have to be prepared for people to say, you know, this isn't any good. I mean, I get scripts from people that that are their first scripts or their second script, and I'll tell them, hey, this isn't any good, and I'll tell you why it isn't good, and you can either run away and screaming and hate me, or you can learn from it. I don't care what you do. Because I'm, I'm not going to get emotionally involved in, in your angst over being a screenwriter because that just is, you know, you don't want yeah. to. Do. 
Right. But but you can learn or not learn from it. But there's, I mean, it's just like choosing what to write about is so important because I, you know, I got a script one time and it's in the book. I got a script about scrapbooking and about how great scrapbooking is. And nobody wants to see that movie. <laughs> there isn't a person on earth who's going to buy a ticket to see a movie about scrapbooking. Right. But, and so you have to learn about what are you going to write about? How can you write something that's different? If you're going to write a revenge movie, it better be way different from any other revenge movie ever written. Because if you write the same revenge movie that every Steven Seagal movie that's ever been made, the chances of you selling it are zero. Yeah. Well, Bob, it, it's been so much fun to actually talk to you after all of these months. I know we connected on social media a while back and I follow you uh, on Twitter and Facebook. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you on these social media platforms? You can find me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at, at B O B S N Z which is my last name without the A and the E. And then on Facebook, just as me, Bob Sines. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you know, come, come. Uh, and I'm on the internet somewhere. Uh, I have an old, <laughs> I have a terrible website that I have to update because it's like, I haven't touched it in like three years. And, um, and you can, I think there's a, there's a email address there that it's Bob at Bob com that you can email me if you want to. And, and your movie extracurricular activities is still available right here. Extracurricular activities. Nice. And it's still available on Amazon. You know, right? Blair on you. Cause this is not a JJ Abrams movie. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, that's it. It's on Amazon prime on Amazon prime, uh, for free now. And it's on Apple and it's on voodoo and it's on, you name it, it's everywhere. But I think you have to pay two ninety nine on Apple, something like that. And of course your book, that's not the way it works is available on Amazon as well. Yeah. It is published. It is everywhere. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, both as a uh, Kindle and a paperback by the paperback because you can make notes in it, which a lot of people have told me that's what they do. Um, and it's available from Barnes and Noble. It's available from almost any of the bookstores. If they don't have it, they can order it, uh, because it's in the bookstore catalogs. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's not many places you can't get it. So, and, um, just to, uh, I, I guess a suggestion to my listeners, if, if you're going to buy this book and I highly recommend that you do. Uh, that you get it from a local bookseller to support your local bookstore. I know they're going to be struggling with um, with sales during this time of uh, quarantine. And there are bookstores online, local bookstores online, that you can go on there and say, can you get this book? And they'll go, yes, we can order you that book. So I don't yeah. know how long it's going to take to get it because, you know, most books now are print to order. They don't keep huge stocks of them. And I'm not sure those uh, those places are operating but they probably are i don't know well it's been a lot of fun bob thanks for talking to us oh are you kidding brian i just i've been looking forward to this uh and uh hope we can you know either a do it again or and or b keep in touch so we, next time we talk let's make it happen in person i think it's a good idea and we can talk about music because that's my other passion yeah that's a whole nother subject matter that we yeah. didn't even touch on so touch on next time on music because I've been, I played guitar and mandolin for like 60 years. <laughs> so. Awesome. Awesome. Bob, you take care and be safe down there. All right. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. <laughs>